coding uh, by Yun Wang, Yan Zheng Qi, Alpha Slam, Yun Long Hei, and Kori. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, first, the, the, the main author is Yun Long, who couldn't come, so I'm giving this. Um, <coughs> I'm Arthur. Um, okay, so. Uh, this is unfortunately one of these one of these uh, things where we wanted to do something big and it didn't quite work out as well as we want. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I think there's one really nice idea. Even though it didn't work, the idea is still really nice, and I have hope that in the future it will work. So we wanted to do something ambitious. What actually happened was less ambitious. So most of the talk I'm going to talk about the dream rather than the uh, than the, than the um, pedestrian reality. So okay, so what do we want? We wanted a uh, model of images that is translation and information, uh, deformation invariant, but composition invariant. And so this is kind of a, I guess, a pretty standard thing in um, natural language models. Um, it I mean, seems to be gaining some steam in, uh, for images and for objects as well. But what you want is a parameterization of the space of objects or some sort of embedding of the space of objects and a composition operator. So that you can take, you know, a piece of an object, 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 apply the composition operator. Each of these pieces is embedded in the object space. You arrange them in the right way. You hit it with the composition operator. You get another object in the space. Um, so in short, the outputs of the parts of an object arranged spatially um, fed into um, fed into the um, composition operator give back an, another object. And of course, you have a combinatorial problem here because you know. You know, if each time you talk about a composition operator, you, you've, mass, you've, you've multiplied the size of your space by the number of things you're composing. Um, so, again, this is, I mean, this is, this is not a particularly new idea. Um, in, for <coughs> objects, there's Leo Ju's paper. Um, there is uh, Leon Botu's paper, which will be very, uh, which, which we drew a lot of inspiration from, and um, Ronald Glover's uh, um, natural language from scratch. And in fact, there's even a, several things in this conference. Um, for example, um, Bowman and also Huang in this conference where, where they use compositional, you know, you want to do some sort of semantics via composition. Um, by the way, and of course the history is much longer than that. I just, I'm, I'm naming some proximal um, influences. Okay, so, so what are we talking about composition? We were, we're talking about the, uh, you know, if, if we're going to talk about images, we have a 2D grid. And we uh, assume that we have some sort of object space, which we'll call O. So because we're used to it, we'll map O and RD. And what we're going to want is an embedding of all the objects into RD. That's O. O has the entire space of all the objects. And you have a mapping from uh, O to 4 or O to the 9, depending on how your grid is arranged or some other um, product of O. Um, back into O. And again, mapping from a product of a space back into the space is a concatenation operator. Um, and the way we think about it is you have a dimension reduction on each of the, say, four pieces. Let's call it G. And then you reconcatenate. Or if you want a slightly more powerful model, you have but you concatenate first and then you um, follow with the dimension reduction. So schematically, it looks like this. You have a... Hmm, I can't... Is there, is there a pointer? Anyway, so I'll kind of look over here. Uh, so you have, you have your four featured vectors. Each of these Bs is an uh, element of O, and they're arranged, um, they're arranged on the grid. Let's say you do a dimension reduction via G. Um, that gives you four new vectors that are arranged on the grid, and then you concatenate them. And that big vector you get back um, is the new guy in O. And hopefully, uh, the the squish dimension is the big dimension over four in this case. So you map right back into the same space. Okay? Um, so again, um, this is just a recurrent network, right? Because the, the inputs are just fed right back into the outputs just at one scale up. Um, another way of saying it, and we'll talk maybe a little bit more about this in, in a couple of slides, is that. Uh, you think of pooling as a trainable dimension reduction. So it's not entirely obvious from this. It, it, it is there, but it's really messy. When, when we talk about the way we actually build the model uh, in a few slides, then it'll be more clear. But you can think of pooling as a trainable dimension reduction. 
and the point of the pooling is to, you know, staunch the combinatorial explosion. Um, again, what we have is a spatially recurrent low rank compact. Um, so this now we're getting to the one idea, which I think is a new idea and is actually pretty interesting. Um, okay, sorry. So let's see. Okay, so one idea which is uh, which I think is actually pretty interesting, which is that if you have a recurrent map like this, if you have a, some sort of recurrence like this, instead of thinking about it as a recurrent thing, you can think about as a mapping from 04 to 0. There's just there's no recurrence. There's no inputs and outputs. There's just one space, right? It's the same space that you're taking your inputs from, the same space you're doing, you're getting your outputs from. The only thing you need to learn is an embedding and the composition map, mapping. Uh, so, so you kind of uh, you squish all the recurrence into one piece. Um, so this is really sensible in my mind for images. Images are in some sense scale free. If you look at any scale, you can if you talk about objects at any scale, you can think of them as sub sub objects at a smaller scale. This isn't entirely always obvious for natural language things. You may not this may not be a reasonable uh, intuition. But for images, it seems to be a very reasonable intuition that if you take four objects, you mush them together into a super object, well, that also is an object, and you, you have essentially a scale three. <coughs> so this idea that there's no recurrence, you just have one space, and everything that lives in the same space, every object, every scale lives in the same space, seems, seems to make sense. Um, and you can have some sort of optimization where you alternate between updates of the optimal targets and uh, updates of the, of the mapping F. Um, the problem is, and the reason why we failed to a large extent, is it's ch really hard to choose a loss function or an optimization that just doesn't collapse the system. So you've trade, it, when you look at this as a recurrent system, it's hard to push the gradients through if it's, if it's deep. Um, and in this case, the, there's, no, there's no free lunch. The, way, the reason you pay is because you're trading the F and the embedding simultaneously, the system just wants to collapse. It's really happy to just uh, to just um, collapse off, and so the key is training the dimension reduction and finding the correct contrastive term. Um, and what you find when you try and play this game is that kind of standard graph-based uh, dimension reduction techniques, even kind of unconstrained ones like you know plus Nagamatsu and LLE, have a way too weak contrastive term. So what does uh, Laplace and Eigenmaps or LLE do? Roughly, they say you take a point, its neighbors need to stay its neighbors in the embedding space. Um, well, the simplest way to make neighbors stay the neighbors is to map everything to zero. How do you make things not map to zero? You force the coordinates to be orthogonal. That's actually a very, very weak uh, contrastive term. Um, and what you see if you try and play this game is that very different objects get sent to the same location in the embedding space. Um, and actually, this is true in a lot of things. In text, you can use the predict the middle patch trick if you want to kind of get feature vectors. In other words, your game, you, you try and say, if my, if my features are uh, this one, this one, this one, this one in uh, object space, I, I can try and have a, uh, a loss function that pays when I can't predict the middle patch. The problem is with image patches, and even at, at kind of higher levels of things, uh, in images, it's too easy because you have smoothness. Predicting the center patch, you just you just assume things are smooth, and you can really easily predict the center patch, and so again, you get a collapse. Um, okay, so let me briefly talk about what we actually did, which was significantly uh, less ambitious. Um, so we didn't go straight from patches, which we really wanted to do. We used SID vectors as input. Um, the middle layers are uh, compositional um, and trained unsupervised. Uh, in the way that we wanted to. Um, and essentially, you get a variation on a SIF sparse coding pyramid match, uh, pyramid pool scheme. Um, what was the dimension reduction? So, again, this is the key thing. We used um, essentially uh, Dr. Lim, and you had to very carefully engineer what are the positive um, things that are supposed to be close together and what are the things that are supposed to be far apart. Um, so, again, always. When you look at things in this way, the hard part is to make things not. Uh, if, if you if you use a really strong contrastive term, it's very hard to train, and this is always true. If you contrastive term means keeping um, far away things far away. If you have a reasonably weak uh, contrastive term, it's easier to train, but the thing collapses. 
Um, and so here, the, the way we did it is you say you have your neighbor, um, you, you have your original, you look in original space and you find your neighbors. Um, and you say, okay, my first neighbors, we'll, we'll try and keep them close. The second neighbors, not necessarily the number two, but some carefully engineered number of neighbors away, we'll make sure those are far away. And again, there's, there's some unpleasant engineering there, but you can get something that, that roughly works. Um, and so for the total mapping F, it's parameterized as uh, sparse coding to get a very high dimensional vector, and then a linear dimension reduction that's uh, trained with the Dr. Lin ones um, to get the object space. And what this, now this really looks like a low, low rank convolutional net. If you use a Lista type encoder for the sparse coding, this is precisely a low rank <coughs> convolutional net. You have uh, a bunch of feature maps that map you into very high dimensional space, and then you have uh, a, a low dimensional um, linear embedding. So it's just um, filter, some nonlinearity, filter nonlinearity, and then a filter bank that's uh, very, very tight in feature size. Um, so this is the uh, this is the, the final architecture that we used, and again, this was this is essentially a variation on a SIP pyramid pooled um, system. So an image comes in, uh, you take the SIP vector, you code it uh, using sparse code, um, you feed that into a spatial pyramid pool into a classifier, and then you you play this game where you uh, crush it with a um, with a learned linear mapping. So this is the dimension reduction part. Um, you take the sparse code of, you, you do the concatenation, and you take the uh, sparse code of the concatenated vector, of the dense concatenated vector, vectors, you code those, and you repeat, you pool with the linear train pooling, and so on and so forth. Um, so, we, we didn't actually test this on any kind of real uh, image data sets, we just used the baseline from, uh, it, was a, it was a pyramid pooling thing, so, we show um, reasonable improvement on object physics and so on and so forth. It's really unclear. The, the, the problem with that, as you all know, is that a, uh, a well-motivated graduate student can uh, always get improvement on Caltech 256. So it's unclear how much is, is due to um, the model. Um, but in any case, you do actually get an improvement on uh, baseline from doing this sort of game where you um, concatenate, well, you, you expand concatenate, and then dimension reduce. Expand, concatenate, and dimension reduce. And all those things. Okay, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you don't search for which parts go together? No, that's the, the whole idea is that the machine should figure this out itself. So the whole idea is to make a parts model that is, uh, I mean, exactly in the natural language thing. The, the, uh, the concatenation um, operator and the embedding together tell you which parts go with which objects. So again, I'm, I'm saying this, you know, in the in the dream world, this is what should happen, whether it actually happens or not, and the way we trained it, it's, it's not good. So I have a question about the training. Do you train by, by layer as a joint? So here, it's I think it was I think it was I think it was one. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it was trained in the way that we wanted to train it, but. It was, Okay, so the last talk is going to be 